My guest from today is someone I've been observing from the shadows for two years now. He was one of the co-founders and head of cryptography at Algorand. He has a PhD from MIT, and when he's not playing with systems and protocols, he's a professor at the University of Waterloo. Currently, he's the co-founder of XLR Network, a much-needed permissionless network that allows anyone to build secure cross-chain applications. Sergey, welcome to the show. Great to be here, Vlad. Before we dive like deeper, I'm curious to know which was your finest and your worst moment of your crypto journey. Nice, great, great, great question. <laughs> um, let's see. So, okay, I think those moments have to go back to my grad school, though. Um, I think the, you know, some of the work that I was doing uh, during grad school were around lattice-based cryptography, right? So, for those of you that don't know, kind of lattice-based cryptography is a um, a uh, new direction in cryptography in general that's supposed to solve new use cases uh, for things like computing over encrypted data, right? So for instance, you can take your data, keep it encrypted, still do computations over it, uh, get useful results out of it. Um, and so I did a lot of work trying to kind of push the boundaries of what you can do with encrypted computation using lattice-based cryptography. Um, and some of the interesting things that we did are things like constructing attribute-based encryption for arbitrary programs, right? So for those of you that sort of don't know, kind of traditional encryption allows you to, you know, encrypt and de decrypt data, right? Nothing more, right? And like with things like attribute-based encryption, I can encrypt data and I can give you a, a secret key that's sort of specific to a program, right? And you'll only be allowed to decrypt the data if the program ran on the data or some metadata with it returns true. Okay, do so you happen like fine... sorry, sorry to interrupt. Do you happen to know Diron Lee from Messari? No, I actually don't. Ex because when I asked him about the things that he was like super excited uh, uh from his career, he explained like almost the same thing from when he was back doing his uh, PhD. So, uh you you might want to 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 check uh, uh to check the guy because I think you might share some common things. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, great. Yeah, we'll take a look. Um, but yeah, so kind of a prior to, you know, the work that I was doing, a lot of these functionalities were limited to a very small subsets of programs you can run this on, right? And so what we've done is we've, we've built a protocol that allows you to deliver a key for an arbitrary program, right? To, to an incomplete type of, uh, you know, programs, so well, they have to be converted to circuits. And so I think that problem was open for many years prior to that, right? I think some of the kind of a, you know, most famous cryptographers said that it's a huge open problem in the field and my advisor tried to solve it uh, prior. And, uh, you know, I think it, uh, many people sort of have failed. Um, and, uh, you know, I think through us, um, our work, we actually solved it, which I was super excited about. Um, I think it really pushed the boundaries of lattice-based cryptography in the field. Um, so, yeah, that was, that was exciting. Um, I guess the worst... Uh, not necessarily the worst moment, but I think some of the hardest things we're following that is that we try to construct uh, things like program obfuscation using lattice-based cryptography, right? And program obfuscation is another big uh, open problem in the field. It's been around for like 30 years. Um, you know, we didn't quite solve it. I think we did come up with very interesting directions, which have been improved upon afterwards. Um, but, uh, you know, it was definitely... Uh, challenging <laughs> and requ required me to spend a lot of you know nights with uh, many notebooks uh, trying to, to break through it which <laughs> was a, a mental and a physical challenge on its own in in the description i said the magic word cross chain uh, we've been speaking about interoperability for years now but not much has happened uh, a few years ago i was sure that um, the tech would be moving faster but I knew that is a bias, right? Why Axler and why now? Great. Um, why Axler? Because I think we built the best and the most secure transport layer that can connect across very different ecosystems, right? I think a lot of previous approaches either were uh, assuming very strong properties of the underlying consensus mechanisms that um, need to be connected, or there were ad hoc, you know, centralized one-off bridging protocols, right? Um, now, what we have done is really build 
a layer that can be used to connect different consensus mechanisms, do it in a secure way using you know proof of stake consensus mechanisms uh, of many other blockchains, and really enable simple experiences for the users to interact with these different environments. Um, so why now? Because I think the demand for this keeps on growing and will only continue growing over the years, right? I think even if you ask me two or three years ago, well, even two years ago, I think people were still questioning, right, where mm -hmm. the blockchain ecosystem will go. I think many people have said, well, look, like Ethereum is going to upgrade tomorrow. And so everything is going to be on Ethereum. So like all these other chains that you guys are working on are going to be useless. Um, you know, I, I think we're still waiting for the Ethereum upgrade, but it's clear to me that even after it upgrades, you know, it's not going to solve all the issues. I think you have a beautiful different networks with beautiful different properties, right? From, you know, privacy to chain specific, uh, or application specific chains to chains that have very different smart contract environments and, and they're all growing and they're all helping us expand and, and they're all hoping, uh, helping us bring more users to the ecosystem, right? Because no matter what, you can't run a full ecosystem on, on one chain. So you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to have many chains, you're gonna have to shard them, you're gonna have to connect them. So I think the need for interoperability is only gonna keep on growing as we grow the space. What was the, the your first thought when you heard about Ethereum? I think my my thought was interesting model. This cannot scale. Uh, because of proof of work underneath it, right? And I think, um, you know, I think if you look at it, some of the early works behind our grant that we've done kind of date back to like 2014, right? 2015, um, when we just right away went after solving some of the scalability issues with Ethereum. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think to me, kind of a from a being a technologist, I think when I see a technology, I, I, I usually, you know, try to evaluate it pretty quickly. Um, but that being said, I mean, I think, you know, Ethereum, you know, put us to the next level with programmability, right? With uh, ecosystem development, with a community, uh, which ended up being uh, very beautiful. In a recent episode, I had someone you know very well, Dean Tribble from Agoric, and we discussed the Cosmos SDK and why uh, he chose that ecosystem. Axelar uses Cosmos SDK, uh, SDK as well. Whenever I ask developers about layer one protocols they like, they, men they mention uh, Cosmos as highly underrated. Do you agree and why is that? Yeah, I think it's definitely underrated. I think the uh, reason for this is because in Cosmos, there are a lot of great builders Right, you know, including Dean, you know, including you know Zachy and you know Ethan and many other folks that over the years been focused on building um, and it built a lot of great technology. I think Cosmos and ecosystem is not you know the strongest in marketing. I would say right, um, and I think um, it's been sort of in its own bubble for a while, right, uh, in its own development pace. Uh, done a lot of right technical decisions but mm -hmm. you know been moving in parallel i mean i do believe that like as we connected with other chains through you know axler we're gonna see that ecosystem mature and go to the next level because it gives you you know very interesting properties where you can build you know an application specific chain and still have it talk to everyone else right either through idc or through axler for evm chains so i think that's going to be super super powerful for applications that need that support at the consensus layer, right? That cannot have, you know, shared environments with, with other applications. Do you think in crypto, do we need more developers or marketers? Um, I would like to say we need both. Yeah, obviously, um, but what, what do we need yeah. more? I think the infrastructure is falling behind actually, right? And I think you think we, so? I think so, yeah. So, and the reason is the following. Um, you know, I think we're still early in the infrastructure development, right? Like whatever we're doing with Axel, we're still setting up core infrastructure protocols, you know, services to route messages, to deliver payloads from one ecosystem to another, uh, to understand what connectivity means, what are the semantics of it, what are the security models. Um, we're still educating the market in a lot of those things. And 
that's early, right? In a in a development. Yeah. If you look at this at the similar um, technical development of the internet, I would say the applications were further behind. Right? Yeah. Um, when the, when when people were asking these infrastructure questions, nobody really used the internet for the most part at that point. On the, in the blockchain system, we're serving reverse because we we're still asking this core fundamental question, setting up these transport layers, but there are quite a lot of interesting applications, right? From yeah. financial applications to NFTs, uh, and you know, we have millions of users that are using these ecosystems, getting value out of it, you know, um, some overnight, some over years. Um, and, um, but I think, you know, every time we, um, we have those applications, when they try to bring in like millions of users, you see some technical problems, right? We saw it, right. you know, with Bitcoin, people try to do interesting things, okay, limited scripts so people went to ethereum ethereum great you know could do program things then we saw you know scalability issues then people started to move into other chains there was solana and there's like avalanche you know some of them have sometimes higher transaction fees some of them go down once in a while still connectivity is still uh being explored um so yeah i definitely think we need a lot more work on the infrastructure and the kind of the protocol uh protocol layer because i think the, the thing that you know will it's it will be pretty bad as you bring in more people to the ecosystem when they see you know 100 bucks for a transaction fee it's such yeah. a very bad precedent right and i mean I, i've been on board in you know people to crypto in various shapes and forms over the last years you know they play with like cosmos chains or like osmosis you know they pay nothing or pay you know a couple pennies and they go to you know ethereum and they're like what's going on here <laughs> like i can't like I, I can't learn an ecosystem where every time i press a button i have to pay you know a hundred dollars <laughs> you, you recently onboarded avalanche uh kindly explain uh what it means for axelar but also uh, also for avalanche yeah so i think avalanche has a very interesting take on the consensus layer itself right and i think it's a very interesting ecosystem that we're it's just starting to grow right it's it's a it's a young chain it has you know uh evm support it has kind of a notion of uh, subnets that will allow it to scale beyond a single chain um and so what it means is that in the early days of that development by connecting through axler and you know a dozen other chains that will already support that chain can grow and compose right and uh with other ecosystems which is really critical to bootstrap uh an early ecosystem right having access to assets come in and out having access for the programs to interact with other programs uh on different chains um having users that are don't have to go through you know centralized exchanges or sell their tokens on one chain to get like avax on another chain so yeah, I think by connecting Avalanche, you know, I think technically the guys are doing a lot of interesting things, but also having th this connectivity allows them to bootstrap their ecosystem at a much faster rate than than otherwise, and having to sort of organically grow the assets on the chain, for instance, which is you know much harder um, uh, as we've seen from other chains that try to bootstrap that way. This also compounds the network effects within your ecosystem, right? Exactly. Yeah. You've recently announced a grants program for developers who want to build what you called Web3 super apps. How was that received? It was received amazing. I mean, I think uh, I think when we're putting it out, we actually gave a very short notice to developers. I think the, the program ran for like two or three weeks. Um, I I think we got yeah overwhelmed with applications, um, and we I think actually already. You know, allocated more than we originally anticipated uh, through this program. Um, yeah, and uh, I think we'll probably an announce kind of the formal numbers and everything in, in the in the coming weeks. But definitely a lot more interest than um, I originally thought that this would get. I think I, I thought we'll have to do a lot more work to get developers to build cross chain. But it ended up that every developer wants to go cross chain now, right? You either obviously. You know, yeah, you, you kind of either an established application and then you need distribution, right? And like scale or your new application that's looking to find, you know, a new, unique differentiator in the market, right? And having a cross-chain support is definitely a unique differentiator and a much wider distribution that you can get otherwise. So it, it now you have some good problems to have, right? 
These are, these are good problems, yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> sure. A few years ago, when Ethereum was miles away from any competitor, and you spoke about this like briefly, we were told that layer one is a winner-takes-all business. We've seen a few others coming up during the last bear market, and right now they continue to appear. And we have around, I might be wrong, but it could be like 20 in the top 100 by market cap. How do you see this unfolding in the next few years? Yeah, great question. So my thinking is the following, you know, we're going to need layer ones that have things like, you know, EVM contracts or, you know, Rust contract was and whatever that is, where developers can go and deploy applications with one click and leverage like the compounding effects and the ecosystems that have already been built. The primary goal for developers that are building on top of, you know, these environments is to find initially like a product market fit. Right? Mm -hmm. When you find a product market fit, you you need to execute fast, right? You need to prototype, you need to get in front of the users, understand if there is a value in what you're building, um, you know, make sure it can connect with different ecosystems, with different assets, with different chains, um, and see if users like it. Okay. From there, I do think that some applications, and we've seen it over the last few years, that have found product market fit, sometimes will need to isolate their resources from other applications to guarantee the same level of experience for their users with low transaction fees, you know, um, low latency, high throughput. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then in that case, what those applications will have to do is figure out how do you get that, right? Do you go and build your own sidechain, a rollup, um, you know, a subnet? Where do you deploy that code to give you a more sort of fine-grained isolation of your resources? to mm -hmm. deliver the best experience for the users while still being able to interact with all the other chains and not lose your networking effects that you have built in, in, in one ecosystem, right? So um, so that's how I think about it, is that you know people go build on these environments that are as simple as possible to get things done, find the product market fit. If you're there you know, in hundreds of uh, thousands of users or you know thousands of transactions per second, you're going to need to find potentially a more isolated home base for your applications and, and your users. So I think there's going to be value for these layer ones. And I do think there is going to be a value for um, other types of uh, scaling technologies that we're seeing in the market. I will, I will go back uh, to Axelar because I remember I had a question and I forgot to, to ask it. When have you defined the vision for Axelar and what was the process? Because interoperability was like a topic for like, way before uh, you started Axelar. Yeah. So when we actually started with Yorgos, um, you know, the company, we had some specific use cases that we wanted to, to solve, right? Things like, you know, cross-chain DEXs. I think we had a, a couple other examples that we were looking at. And so we actually wanted to see what is the best, you know, stack or platform to build those things, right? And, um, you know, I think you didn't really have anything in the market. I think the closest that, you know, that we've seen uh, were things like, you know, okay, IBC, which is a protocol, right, uh, for, for connectivity. Uh, you had Polkadot. Um, you had some uh, application-specific uh, interoperability chains, I call them, like, you know, ThorChain, I think, is an example, right, that yeah. where the whole stack was built to solve an application in mind. And so, and I think we kind of realized that that, that could not scale, right? So... What we need is a more general connectivity tissue that mm -hmm. we can deploy as rapidly as uh, as the ecosystem grows to allow people to build these cross-chain enabled applications in a simple way, right? And so that's how you know the vision came about, kind of from thinking about specific you know sets of use cases, thinking about how you build them cross-chain, and then realizing that there is a huge kind of infrastructure gap that, that we still have to address before we can get there, and um, you know that infrastructure will have. Um, a lot of value for the whole ecosystem. What was one strategic decision that Algorand uh, could have made, like uh, like a better uh, strate uh, strategic decision? So I think what I have learned over the years is that there is a huge power for building protocols and networks with the community, right? Mm. Um, you know, I think at Algorand when we were uh, doing a lot of the things. You know, amazing researchers, right? Amazing team uh, backgrounds. Like everybody was really enjoying working together. Um, 
but I think in some sense we kind of were driving the things and not listening enough, right? Um, and I think what I've learned like through Axel and just in general working in the ecosystem, the more you listen to your community, the more you listen to your developers in the early days, the more you actually build with them alongside, the better your technology ends up and the better the products end up being and the more networking effects and the more ecosystem you have, right? So I think this is something, you know, we're definitely uh, improving over the years. You know, Axel, we've been building, you know, um, kind of open source and a lot of a lot of tooling was built by our community, which, uh, you know, some of them ended up being uh, um, f uh, completely amazing tools, right? Like things like XLRScan.io, it was actually built for, like from our community. Um, you know, some sample applications were built uh, from our community members. Um, and I think it's, it, it's super powerful. And, and so definitely, um, I think that's one thing to, to continue um, doing in the future. I can confirm that you are doing a good job uh, at Axelar because by doing my research for this discussion that we have, I found like some of the things that you've mentioned, and I found also the content that uh, the people are uh, are like putting out there, and I think uh, it's it's super interesting because you know usually when the projects are like before actually going live and meeting like all the the I don't know the shit on Twitter and so on and so forth. It's difficult to build a community because usually community is driven by the token price and so on and so forth. So if you manage to build that that early in the process, that's a very good sign, I guess. Yeah, thank you. And uh, you know, I think a part of it was actually been kind of a various non-technical programs that we run, right? So for instance, mm -hmm. we ran a, a quantum community program where people could um, contribute by writing, you know, tutorials, by creating, you know, images or graphics around Axelar, um, which uh, I think gives them exposure to the technology, right? They have to think about what is Axelar, you know, how do you represent it? How do you create a visual around it? How do you write even, you know, a simple blog post explaining what that is and kind of communicate into those audiences? Um, so I think that's been super powerful. I think our community in Thailand is amazing, by the way, right? If I had to call one out, I think like you, you see people doing everything from like kind of building furniture, right? Like there's like, I think there's like an actual Yeah, coffee I've shop. seen that. I've seen that. It's like, I, th I thought, I thought that is like super crazy because wh when I've seen that, I thought it was like Photoshop, right? And then I realized, oh no, it's not Photoshop. Actually, someone actually did it. I mean, I think, Reactions from our team was like it's easier to Photoshop that than to actually build exactly, it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But how come Thailand? How that happened? No idea. I mean, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you, you search you for know, a good answer, but there was none. <laughs> no, I mean, a you know, I think we we do have some uh, early members from Thailand community that you know, approached us, started to engage with us. Um, we had, I think, uh, some early investors who were actually from Thai community, and, you know, maybe they helped to, to spread the message in the early days. Um, and then I think, yeah, a couple different projects that we've been working with that sort of approached us. Um, what we're trying to do is to help people, I think, to do what they're trying to do in their missions. Okay. And I, and I think kind of a strongly within the company, uh, we keep on talking about this every day, which is when we work with a developer or when we work with a project, like. What can we do for them, right? Because they're doing a lot already for us. Like they're spreading, you know, our message and you know, um, uh, using our technology. But I think it's our responsibility um, because they help us. We need to help them to, you know, realize their visions and realize their dreams. And I and I take that very, you know, very, um, you know, very personally. And I think it's it's important uh, for the ecosystem. Yeah, that's awesome because I think this is how Web three should go, right? Yep. Which are the top three things you'd build tomorrow if Axler wasn't a full-time job for you? Outside of interoperability? Yeah, obviously. I, I've seen one. I've seen the um, Auditor's DAO, which I think it's a very interesting idea. But tell me two more. Good. <laughs> um, let me think about it a couple of seconds. Uh, well, I mean, I, I still think kind of a global and universal payments is still not solved. Mm -hmm. um, I think, 
you know, I I traveled a lot like through my through my life. You know, I was born uh, kind of you know in, in Russia, then we lived in Canada. You know, with my family for a while, then U.S. I think basic things like credit score <laughs> are not mm-hmm. transferable. <laughs> basic things like payments uh, across different borders are still very very painful. Um, and so I, I guess I would like to see more applications that actually solving some of the user needs and some of the user pains that we've been we sort of started the field with those applications in mind. And I think a lot of early narratives was around, you know, cross-border payments, you know, uh, financial inclusion and things like that. I think over the last few years, those narratives have been lost in some sense. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I would like to definitely see uh, more traditional types of use cases that actually solve people need. So I think that's one. Um, two, I mean, I think if you, yeah, um, follow some of the, uh, some of our branded and some of the messaging out there, I mean, I, I really like robots. So, um, you know, I think I would do something around that. Um, <laughs> I don't, I, I don't know what exactly I, I'm, I'm a newbie for the most part when it comes to that, I just try to talk to people and learn uh, some of these issues, but I still don't understand why we don't have more <laughs> robotic technology in our daily lives. I think it's hard, man, right? I hear you. <laughs> but everything is hard. You know, I, I think this is extra hard because Whenever why? Okay. Why? Why? I, so let's go there. <laughs> first of all, I think we have some moral issues around that. Uh, mm-hmm. I think not not we, no, not us, but probably the society has some um, moral issues around like robotics uh, and robots. Uh, and secondly, I think the monetization uh, of this technology might outside industrial uh, area, uh, I think might be a little difficult. I don't know, I'm just saying. Maybe maybe the, the people who might have the brain to actually do it, they have more shiny things to, uh, to occupy their time, right? Yeah, um, I mean, valid points, but I, I, you know, I think at the same time, um, I mean, I don't know, but like still a lot of the work that we're doing in everyday lives, it's still, you know, I think can be automated, right? And can be made uh, simpler. Even things like, you know, delivery of packages, right? Okay, we're talking about like drones and things like that, that, you know, you can use, but it's still not used anywhere, right? Um, I think we're, a lot of it is because like we're stuck with trying to retrofit these new technologies in traditional infrastructure stacks. Right, like around you know our existing cities, our existing you know, environments, and exactly. high-rise buildings, and um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I would like to go beyond that. I think, in some sense, right? I think uh, you know we can build new infrastructure from scratch, which often ends up being a lot easier <laughs> than having to work with you know politicians and your know, traditional <laughs> environments. Um, yeah, I don't know. These things uh, I think are quite important as we. Uh, continue scaling, right? As the population keeps on increasing, I think definitely um, we'll need to um, kind of automate more and more um, and change the way you know we live. I think the pandemic has changed the way we live in many ways, right? People moved uh, kind of outside yeah. of the cities um, in the, um, many of the countries, um, and I think trends like this will probably only keep on uh, increasing in their frequency, right? Speaking. Uh, Speaking of like growing population, what do you think about like living forever? Yeah, I haven't thought too much about it. My initial reaction is come that... on, I can't, I can't believe like you are interested in robots, but you are not interested. Like this topic of like living forever and aging and everything was not on your uh, radar. Yeah, I mean, okay, I guess you know a lot of the things that we, we we're trying to do is because we're trying to you know take everything to the next level and build history in some sense. So the first right. question that, you know, I have to ask, okay, if we all live forever, what is history? <laughs> because you all remember everything, you know, everything right. is, uh, everything is um, like, you, you don't have a sense of urgency in some sense, right? If, if I know I was, I was, I was, I was, I was to live forever and, you know, everybody, you know, that we were working with at the company and everyone else around us knew that they all lived forever. 
what are you trying to get to? Because you always have tomorrow. <laughs> so, true, you know, true. I, I fully agree to, with that. I fully agree. You know, complete the task yeah. or, uh, you know, take the a field or an industry to the next level. Um, at least right now, I always have this urgency, which is like, well, okay, we have to do it today because we never know what's going to happen tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, but imagine religion because right now, like everyone behaves well because everyone, at least the people who, uh, who are believers, they behave well because they want to go to heaven. But if you don't fucking die, like you don't have that moral issue anymore, right? And if you don't have it, how you will behave starting from tomorrow it's a it's a good point yeah but at the same time do you think there is one human being that in the moment when he's on the deathbed and he or she sees the nephews the, the sons and everyone everyone the friends and someone comes and say like this small pill will just put you back on track you'll be able to see your grand uh children you'll be able to live like 100 years more if there is no accident and so on and so forth do you think any human being will say no definitely think some human beings will say no right you know you still have unfortunate <laughs> you know <laughs> situations where people don't want to you know True. live uh, for whatever reasons right um you know, I think when you, yeah, I think when you start thinking about living forever, you have to start thinking what has happened with our emotional state in those environments, right? Uh, do we, you know, get tired? Do we get excited the same way? Do we get burnt out the same way, right? Do everything we, uh, changes. Everything, everything changes. changes right? And this, this discussion around, around living forever is interesting because we are trying to imagine with our, the mind and the, and the mindset that we have today, how it will be a completely new setup that probably we, look like COVID changed how we think like in two years, this new uh, open door will probably change our, like everything that we, we, we think about like in a, like a, for a few days or, or weeks or whatever. Right. Yeah. Makes sense. I mean, I think, you know, uh, not suggesting that people do it, but, you know, you can do a social experiment technically where, you know, let's say like <laughs> some kids could be brought up thinking that they would live forever. And I'm curious, you know, how their lives would, ch would change, right? Um, imagine, uh, Im imagine how scared uh, we will be of accidents or being like killed or like, because we are putting all our um, hopes into like living forever and suddenly someone comes and kills you like everyone will have like a paranoia uh around this topic of being killed or being injured or yeah but then you know you can always just take the the human brain and put it in a you know in a in a robotic uh skeleton exactly um, but there you go there you go <laughs> it, it, it's pretty pretty this topic anyways uh tell me something you thought you knew for sure when you were 20 and it proved completely wrong Great question. <laughs> you have a lot of good questions. <laughs> um, let's see. What do they think about? Um, hmm. That's a good question. Um, yeah. Well, I, I think, you know, at 20, I definitely didn't have an opportunity to kind of, you know, um, work with. Um, all the people that I had a fortune working with and just kind of seeing everyone's kind of creativity and, and, you know, seeing everybody's uh, way of thinking. So I think, you know, definitely when I was at, at, at 20, I had a more kind of, you know, uh, focused view of how people think, how people react and how people make decisions. Um, you know, I think through my ex experiences and, uh, you know, in grad school and afterwards, I think I was very uh, pleasantly just surprised by, how people make decisions, how people think, why people do certain things. Um, and, you know, definitely some people have better intentions than others. <laughs> um, and that's definitely something um, kind of learned over the years. That was a great answer, man. Tell me someone from the crypto space you wouldn't bet, bet against and why. Anyone. 
excluding yourself. <laughs> But, <laughs> nice. Uh, good question. I guess it's it's hard because I actually don't think right. You you know you know these things. Um, I think you know even the. Um, okay, how about this? I'll actually answer a slightly different question. Right. I think we should bet against. We should bet more against people that are famous in the crypto space. How about that? Because I think, why is that? Yeah. So, and I think with I've seen this, you know, in in many places like academia, startups, and everything else. I think when people reach, you know, a certain level of fame, they are questioned less. Okay, and people take what they say for granted. I mean, I can certainly tell you that, like, you know, in grad school, that's definitely the case, right? Where mm -hmm. you know, if you see a paper from you know famous researcher and academic. Um, you you know people question it less. That being said, I think the more famous people are, or at least in many cases, I'm not saying you know uh, there are no exceptions. The less time they actually have to think <laughs> because they, you know, they're busy doing other things. They're kind of overwhelmed with uh, um, all kinds of work and all kinds of opportunities. So I think they naturally spend less time uh, flashing out their ideas or flashing out. Uh, you know, their views. Um, and I think they could be wrong more often <laughs> for those reasons, right? Uh, just because, yeah. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll be following you closely to see what you will be doing when you'll be like su a super celebrity. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. I guess I'll, maybe I should take them less of the, you know, podcast interviews and <laughs> spend more time <laughs> thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me one question. Uh, we're, we're close to the end. Tell me one question that you don't have a good answer to. Um, okay. Um, except except the robotics one because you already said that why people are not <laughs> using more. Uh, don't have a good answer to. <clears throat> uh, well, I, I think I still try to grasp, you know, kind of a the usefulness of a lot of AI. How about that? I think a lot of <laughs> artificial intelligence technologies and models, and definitely like a lot of buzz around it. Mm -hmm. um, I think people still don't know where it's used and not used. People still, you know, an average person doesn't quite understand the difference between artificial intelligence and a regular algorithm in some sense, right? And I think it'll be interesting to see um, where the technology, you know, lands, how, how far uh, of a reach it will have and how much people will understand that it functions and behaves very differently than let's say like the traditional algorithms or programs that they were used to when they were, you know, in the kind of high school or their undergraduate degree or through whatever courses they, they took. So I think that's a, that's still quite an interesting uh, question. You know, maybe people have an answer. I just, you know, don't have not been following, you know, those uh, advancements over the last few years that closely. My last two questions are while You are an active part of this crazy crypto ride. Do you ever feel that history is being written before your eyes? Definitely, I think so. Um, I mean, I think if you look at everything we're doing um, is changing the way people interact, right? Um, whether or not it's through DAOs, whether or not it's through, you know, people learning how to provide LP on a decentralized exchange, mm -hmm. right? Whether or not people, you uh, you know, learn how to build uh, a video game based on, you know, tokens or assets that are tradable and globally accessible. I think all of those things um, make us question sort of traditional systems. I think uh, those are all interesting experiments. You know, some of them fail, some of them succeed. Uh, Uh, and that's how you make history, right? I think the infrastructure work that a lot of the projects are doing uh, and building, it's definitely you know a part of the history as well, um, because all of that shapes, in some sense, how you build and interact with the systems, right? There is a, a difference between a permission system and a permissionless system, right? And once you have a system that's sort of permissionless, it allows you, you know, to involve community, to involve very active participants, to um, 
change how businesses are structured, right? Like mm -hmm. one good example that I that I give is that kind of a web two, it's all about the data, right? Like I collect as much data as possible, I monetize from it afterwards, and I make sure that nobody gets access to the data unless they pay me, right? In web three, that paradigm, at least so far, has been flipped because data is public, right? Everybody can use the data. You know, I can go and build up, you know, an indexer or a data analytics company on top of all these public data sets. So the data is not uh, is not what allows you to monetize. It's more about networking effects and about community, right? That's what allows you to you know um, to build the businesses and successful businesses around that. And that's definitely a way uh, to change the business models. Yeah, I think I think it's important for builders in this industry to have a sense of history because I think it contributes to accountability. It contributes to having a long term vision and. Uh, I'm happy when people are, when I heard, I'm hearing like answers saying like, yeah, I have a sense of history. I think history is being written uh, before my eyes because this trans, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, I actually wanted to ask you a question, right? What do you think is the single most important, you know, lesson from the history that builders should know? Holy smokes. <clears throat> And the fun part is that my background is in history. So uh, if, if I will not come with with a good answer, I, I will look like an idiot. Uh, but I'm comfortable looking like an idiot. Um, I think I'm not sure is is the best answer, obviously. But you were mentioning the fact that scaling is not happening as we thought. And I think historically when cities coming back to the to the metaphor uh, Hossib published uh, like recently that blockchains are cities, I think historically cities always always had problems when it came to uh, to scaling because the, the the bigger like the the more opportunities a city has, the more people are coming and every time the roads are too small for anything from commerce to like uh, transportation and so on and so forth. And I think being comfortable with the fact that it will grow more than you think, uh, I think it's a good lesson for, for, for the builders in, uh, in, in this industry because I think Developers, from like my experience of like discussing with, uh, we have an internal uh, an internal team uh, of developers and a pretty successful one because they worked uh, in consensus and so on, so they have some experience. And I realized by speaking with them that they are usually very focused on what's in front of them for like for the next few weeks and months, and they execute, 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 and they have some blind spots when it comes to the bigger picture. And we are in a moment in time in crypto, I think, where scaling is very important. And because it will happen like super, it will go slow, 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 and then super fast. And I think the developers and the builders that realize this is the moment in time and they realize that this is how it happened before, I think they'll be successful. Yeah. I mean, I think that, right, that, that's why I'm actually very excited about giving developers tools and ability to build their own cities, right? Uh, in some sense, you can go and build your own city and, you know, connect it and have a, you know, an airport and lay down, you know, a highway to talk with other cities. And uh, kind of a back to the point, I do think as, you know, as the number of applications grow, right, as the number of users grows and the population grows, that's, you know, an inherent and an absolutely needed way to scale, right? Um, you can only have so many big cities and only grow them at a certain rate. And, uh, you know, at some point when there is a problem like a pandemic, everybody moves out. When, yep. you know, when yeah. there is a problem with transaction fees, everybody moves out. I think I think you should write a medium post about cities and interoperability because I think it will be like a nice follow up after like the blockchains are cities. If blockchains are cities, what the heck is interoperability interoperability between these cities, right? 
So I actually just wrote, you know, blog post, not exactly this, but kind of on the horizontal scaling of the blockchain ecosystem where we made some analogies between, you know, kind of roads, airports, and cities and like how the interoperability infrastructure fits in that. No, I, I, I was saying, I didn't have the mic on. I was saying like, seriously, how come I, I, I haven't seen that? This um, is yeah, I mean, if, if you go to our kind of, you know, axel.network and go to the blog section, I think under, uh, it should be somewhere there. Mm, that's why I missed it. That's why I missed it. Anyways, I, I, I will check that out. So my last question is, let's imagine it's 2009 and you are Satoshi, but you know everything that we learned in the meantime. What would you do differently to change the course of history? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um. Yeah, it's not an answer, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was an acknowledgement that it's a good question. You have a lot of good <laughs> questions. <laughs> uh, I think, mm, I'm not sure I would change much, right? I mean, I think, um, I think kind of, you know, Satoshi and like the Bitcoin had a lot of properties that are, you know, immutable <laughs> in the work that they've done. Um, that are very, very strong, and that's what practically allowed to, you know, uh, bypass a lot of challenges that like academics and other people that took it, mm -hmm. um, that took this problem formally, right, try to solve, right, you know, payments and uh, kind of a double spend and all those things are not new problems, right, people have been talking about them for years uh, prior to this, I think everybody overthought and focused about how does the most beautiful, how does the right system need to look like without experimenting enough? And I think, you know, Bitcoin and Satoshi, they've done an experiment uh, in some sense, which um, in many cases, I think a lot more useful than overthinking and trying to think about like, what is the right technical decision you want to, you know, experiment, you want to try, especially when it comes to things that have been open for, you know, 30 years, right? 40 years. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, so uh, you can go and you know people have been thinking about this 30 years but problem not that many people have tried to do <laughs> things I mean, right I think the, more, the more we try i think the more um the more we learn i know i, I know i've said it's my last question but now i'm curious when have you heard about bitcoin and what what was like the initial reaction that you had i mean it was in grad school when the you know i was at mit um Various folks started to talk about it. I think uh, MIT Bitcoin Club was um, uh, in its early phases and uh, was just formed around those days. Um, I think there was like a Bitcoin ATM that appeared like a you know kind of a couple months later. When um, was that? Wrong. What year? Yeah, so 2013, 2014, right? Mm. Um, is when um, a lot of the noise started to happen. Um, my first reactions, you know, being an, you know, a grad student was again, you know, all the technical limitations of, of this technology, right? And like, what are the use cases? <laughs> um, I think that that was my natural reaction to any paper I've read <laughs> in those days. Oh, so, so you, you're a skeptic by nature, right? As a grad student, you have to be. And then, like, I think, you know, I, I, I had this, you know, belief and I still have it. Like I said, you know, you have to question everything, you know, you see, especially like, you know, a lot of the um, more, you know, uh, senior academics and a lot of the work and a lot of the thinking that they've laid out. I mean, because that was my job. My job was to, you know, to, to break outside of the uh, <laughs> normal thinking barriers in some sense. <laughs> um, so, yeah, th those were my reactions, I would say. Um, and I, I, I'll be honest, I don't think I appreciated everything that was there, you know, in the early days, right? I think, you know, I right away tried to think about how do you change things? How do you, you know, improve things on the technical level or not? Thinking about, again, you know, maybe what a beautiful system, what a, the, the right system should look like. Um, and I, I think, uh, you know, I wish also, you know, I, I, I experimented more myself, right? And actually, you know, uh, played more and understood what the community effects are. I mean, I'm not sure anybody understood those things at that time, but um, I think, you know, definitely my uh, my view on those things have changed over the years. Sergey, thanks a lot for stopping by. This was super fun for me. I hope it was interesting for you as well. <laughs>